Hello and welcome back to this series on the mathematical foundations for classical political economy. Earlier we saw the definition of functions and we also saw linear functions, so the logical progression that we're going to uh, be following is basically to discuss nonlinear functions, right, as well as their graphical representation. So let's remember that we define functions as relationships, as rules that associate with every value of x, so with every value of the independent variable, a single, a unique value of y, so a single value of the dependent variable. And it needs to be single because otherwise we do not have functions, right? Otherwise we have equations like the equation for the unit circle where each value of x is associated with more than one value of y, in particular with two values of y, which means that those equations do not uh, satisfy the definition of a function. Now, we also discussed that the domain of functions are basically the set of values, of possible values that x takes, and the range of the function is the set of possible values that y takes, okay? And when we dived into linear functions, we saw that linear functions are analytically simple because they feature a constant slope that doesn't change as you move across the domain, and therefore, a you can easily graph them by identifying two points in a function and just uh, drawing a straight line passing through those two points, right? Now, of course, in uh, in economics, okay, we are interested in modeling more complex relationships, relationships where as you move across the values of the domain, the slope of the function changes, and this is uh, possible if we study, if we model relationships with nonlinear functions, okay? And nonlinear functions now are going to feature a slope that is a con it's itself a function, another function of the, the independent variable, right? And when we look at uh, derivatives, we will see how you can find these functions and what form they take depending on the original function. Uh, but for now, let's just note that these functions are going to feature a slope that is itself a function of x, okay? Now, there are many different types of nonlinear functions that we can study, and today I'm going to be presenting some broad categories, okay, and some examples within those categories, but in general, in general there are indefinitely many uh, nonlinear functions, so you can use, uh, you know, whichever function you want in the whatever modeling that you're trying to do, so long as it makes sense to use those kinds of functions, okay? Here I'm going to give you what I believe are some of the most important functions that we use in economics and that are used in classical political economy to model the behaviors that we are interested in, right? So let's begin with quadratic functions, okay, uh, which have this general structure that you see here where y is a function of x and this function adopts this polynomial form where there is this uh, coefficient alpha that is multiplied by x to the power of 2 and then you add beta times x to the power of 1 and then you add a constant. And this constant here serves the same purpose as the uh, constant uh, served in the linear case. In the linear case, we saw that this could be called the intercept parameter, and the intercept parameter tells you the value of y when x is equal to zero. Okay, here it's the, the same case, right? Now, note also that alpha cannot be equal to zero, because if it is equal to zero, then this function just reduces, it is equivalent, to a linear function. So in this case, we would not have a quadratic function, right? Now, these functions are uh, special because they feature a unique maximum or minimum depending on the sign of alpha, okay? Depending on the sign of alpha, you can have either a, man a maximum or a minimum. And this is going to be a global maximum or minimum, okay? which uh, in the future we'll be making uh, the more formal distinction between local and global maxima and minima. But for now, let's just note that there's going to be a global maximum or minimum featured by these functions. And it is going to be located that depending, uh, again, on the sign, you're either going to have a maximum or a minimum. But regardless of whether you have a maximum or a minimum, this is going to be located at the point where x is equal to minus beta over 2 times alpha okay, and y is equal to the function evaluated at that value of x, okay, so beta and alpha are given, okay, in, in the function, these are parameters that are given, and therefore, you just find uh, this maximum 
with this uh, very simple formula and then you evaluate uh, the function at that particular value of x and then you obtain the what is called the maximum or the minimum okay in this case we should make the distinction between the minimizer maximizer and the minimum and the maximum right so the minimizer or the maximizer would be the value of x that minimizes and or maximizes the function and the maximum or the minimum is going to be the point okay, at which this maximum is located at right this is an important distinction in practice okay so there are some relationships that we can model with these very basic uh, functions okay i can think of uh, for example the, the the general theory of the laffer curve right which says that uh, as you increase okay, the, in this case we're going to have a maximum right so the sign of this alpha okay the sign of this alpha is going to be negative so what we find in this uh, relationship is that as you increase the tax rate okay tax revenue will certainly increase but at some point it's going to reach a maximum and then after you after that point as you increase the tax rate you're going to obtain uh, tax revenue that is decreasing right that it's decreasing uh, therefore this is an example of a quadratic function of a behavior that can be modeled with quadratic functions and indeed they tend to be modeled with quadratic functions and i can also think for example of the relationship between productivity and hours of labor per shift right which follows this uh, again this um, behavior where if you increase the number of hours per shift productivity initially increases but then it reaches a maximum point and then from there as you increase the labor hours per shift because workers get tired machinery gets uh, uh, used up and so on and so forth then productivity starts to decrease okay so there's a maximum point and what we can see is that graphically okay these functions uh when alpha is negative okay they look here like these parabolas okay that are concave down okay they're concave looking downward and they feature this maximum okay that i was talking about uh which is identified by the the formula that i that i also gave in the in the previous slide okay and here okay you can see that by shifting the 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 coefficient uh the c okay by shifting the constant okay by changing the constant what you're doing is you're shifting either down or up uh either up or down the function okay if you keep everything else the same right because again this is just the intercept so in this case for example with the red line you can see in the rate function that this that the intercept is one so then the intercept coefficient again where the function intersects the y-axis is exactly one and the same goes for for this function and for the other function right so by changing this you're just shifting up or down and this is more or less what you expect for example in the relationship between productivity and hours of work okay hours of work would be here in the x-axis productivity would be here in the y-axis and you could model this okay in this particular way of okay let's see uh, let's say that you're working with uh, moderate intensity okay well with moderate intensity this would be this relationship now if you increase the intensity you are not necessarily changing the the the, the structure of this function what you're just changing is you're shifting upward okay the function and therefore the maximum that you reach okay with higher intensity of work is at a higher point than the maximum that you increased with the moderate intensity of work right so you can play around with these functions and, and, and make these kinds of arguments okay and notice that obviously in this case the economically meaningful uh, relationship between productivity and hours of work is most uh, likely it's actually only in the first quadrant so you would need to look at the first quadrant in order to understand this relationship right because economically it doesn't make sense to talk about negative hours of work right and by changing okay uh, the different uh, the other parameters uh, you can change okay the the shape you can change the location in the in the graph of the function okay but all of these functions you can see that if the alpha is negative are going to be concave down okay they are going to be concave looking downward and they're going to have a maximum 
Now, if the sign is positive, then they're going to be concave upward, okay? And now I, I, I'm not making a strict definition now between convexity and concavity. I will be doing that in, in probably in the next video. Uh, but for now, let's just uh, look at this uh, in this, um, let's say, um, simple uh, sense of uh, concave up or down, okay? This would be concave up, okay? Because it has a minimum, okay? And it, the rest of the function is looking upward. Now, uh, this minimum is, again, located at the same, analytically at the same point, okay? At x is equal to minus beta over 2 times alpha. But now, okay, would you see that what you are modeling here is a relationship where as x increases, originally y is decreasing, but then it reaches the, its minimum point, and now it's increasing ever since that minimum point, okay? When we look at derivatives, we will see... Um, exactly okay how to interpret the the change in the slope as we move across the domain okay and we will see more complicated stuff but for now for now just keep in mind okay how these uh, functions generally look okay and keep in mind that by changing the different um, uh, parameters okay by changing alpha and by changing beta you're changing where the minimum is located at okay and you are also changing, for example, if you keep everything else and you just move alpha, what you are changing is also how um, how close to the y-axis these two segments here are, okay? If you increase alpha by a lot, then these two segments are going to be become closer and closer together, okay? They're going to get closer and closer together. If you reduce it, then they're going to be further apart. Okay, so now let's look at power functions. And power functions, okay, are functions that just feature, okay, a coefficient, and the same alpha that we were talking about before, and now uh, x raised to the power of n, okay, where n can be any real number. And notice that quadratic functions are an example of the sum of two power functions, right? Where one of the one of the functions in the sum is a power function of second order, so a power function where n is equal to 2, and then another power function where n is equal to 1, right? So you add those two functions and you have the quadratic function that I was talking about uh, in the previous slides, right? And this is the general form that they have, okay? This is the general form that they have. Now, if you add, as we're going to see uh, in the next slides, if you add more terms, okay, with different powers to these power functions, then you're going to have polynomial functions of which the quadratic function is an example, right? And by allowing, okay, n to be any number in the in the real line, we are going to obtain different shapes, different relationships between x and y, okay? And it's interesting to see how these relationships change as you change the n. So we're going to start, okay, um, we're going to start with a power functions that feature a positive even exponent. So n is a positive number and it is even, okay, and it is a real number. Now you can see that these look very similar to the quadratic uh, functions that we saw before, okay, because the power is even, we're going to have a unique either maximum or minimum in this case since alpha is positive, we're going to be looking at a minimum, okay? And the minimum here is going to be located, uh, the minimizer is going to be x is equal to zero, and the minimum is going to be the value of y when x is equal to zero. So in the case of, of this line, for example, x is equal to zero, y is equal to zero. Therefore, the minimum is going to be zero, zero, the point zero, zero. The minimizer is going to be x equal to zero. In this case, the minimizer is the same, is x equal to zero, but the minimum is different. The minimum is, the value of y is 0 0.5. So the point is 0 0.5, 0, okay? Depending on, on where you start uh, uh, with x or with y, right? But in any case, you can see in, the, in these three different functions, okay, the minimum is the same. What changes is the the mini the sorry the minimizer is the same. What changes is the minimum, the point at which this minimum is located. But in any case, uh, notice that with uh, an even exponent, these functions look very similar. With the difference that as you increase the power, 
okay and here I, I i increase the power by a lot okay from 4 to 32 you can see that as you increase the power this becomes flatter okay this part of the function leading to the minimum becomes flatter okay here it's not as flat as in this case okay and this is for x is equal to uh, n equal to 4 and this is for n equal to 32. so what we can basically say is that depending on how for example let's say that you want to measure the speed of convergence of a uh, y to the particular minimum okay that, that uh, this function uh, has well maybe depending on how you want to model it you would be interested in increasing or decreasing the power but in any case all of these um, functions featuring this positive even exponent look more or less like this okay now let's look at power functions that feature a positive still positive but an odd exponent okay now we can see that whereas before let's look at this again here okay these functions are uh, symmetric with respect to the y-axis okay they are symmetric with respect to the y-axis but in this case they are going to be symmetric with respect to this point with respect to the origin in the in the, in the case for example of y is equal to x times 3 here this is going to be the symmetry okay it's going to be in in this direction right and now we cannot identify as before a global maximum or minimum okay in this case what we're going to identify for example at this point zero is an inflection point okay it's an inflection point and i'm going to be looking at the definition of inflection point more carefully in the future but for now let's just notice that here there is no uh, global minimum or maximum because the function here decreases to inf to minus infinity so since it minus infinity is not an actual number there is no point okay at which you can find the, the minus infinity then there doesn't exist okay the the minimum the global minimum doesn't exist and the global maximum also doesn't exist because you have this increasing up to plus infinity then these functions are not going to feature a global maximum or minimum if anything they're going to feature local maxima or minima that we, I'm, I'm going to be showing you how to find when we look at derivatives but in these uh, functions you notice that they behave completely different to the functions that we saw before with the uh, even exponent right and here again i just shifted okay these functions uh, changing the the intercept coefficient so that you could see them separately and you can see that in a very in a similar fashion to to before as you increase the exponent okay still being an odd number you can see that this part of the function becomes flatter but the part not leading to the minima or the maxima but leading to this inflection point okay it becomes flatter okay it becomes flatter so depending on how you want to model a relationship following this kind of function you may want to increase or decrease the odd exponent okay okay so these functions that we have been looking at are uh, functions that you can add together in order to attain a polynomial function okay in order to attain polynomial functions and polynomial functions are more complicated than the power functions and thus they are going to allow us to model more even more complicated behaviors than the ones that power functions alone can um, allow us to model so these functions have this general formula here okay where y is equal to a function of x okay and this is the intercept still okay alpha zero is the intercept and now you add okay this summation of the individual coefficients of uh, each of the variables that you're going to raise to to so, so of the same variable raised to different numbers okay numbers going from one to n okay and can be any positive real number and uh, there's going to be a unique uh, coefficient for each one of these uh, exponents and this uh, variable is going to be raised to different exponents obviously right so this is basically what these polynomial functions look like formally and uh, we can look at them graphically okay we can look at them graphically and see basically that they indeed give us more complicated relationships than the ones before that we have seen before so for example at this blue function okay the function that is graphed here in blue you can see that um, we are just adding okay 
two, two, two different x to the power of two different numbers, and on already, okay, by just looking at this very simple function, we can see the complicated behavior that this is telling us, okay, it's telling us that originally y is decreasing as you increase x from minus infinity to this point here, which is 3, okay, and then at some point over here, it starts increasing, okay, but then it slows down, the, the increasing slows down, slows down, and then here there is an inflection point, and then suddenly it starts to increase again at a, at a higher rate, right, so here we can indeed identify a global max, uh, minimum, for example, here we can identify a global minimum, which would be this one, this point here would be the global minimum, but we wouldn't identify a global maximum, okay, although maybe we could obtain uh, formally a, a local maximum, we cannot s obtain from this function a global maximum, right, and I'm going to be showing you, okay, with, uh, again, when, when we look at uh, uh, more formal calculus um, uh, techniques, we're going to be looking at how you can get a sense of these functions, uh, of how the graph of these functions are, just by looking at the derivatives, inflection points, asymptotes, etc. of the functions. And you can see that by adding more terms you get even more complicated functions, like the, the one here in red, where for example, here you would get, if you do the formal calculus uh, on this function, you would get that this is a local minimum, okay, a local minimum, but it's nonetheless not a global minimum because the function here starts decreasing again and it decreases until minus infinity. So, and again, this would be a global ma uh, a local maximum, but this wouldn't be a global maximum because the function here starts increasing again to plus infinity, and there is no global maximum in this function, but there are local. Ma there is a local maximum, certainly, and a local minimum, too. And there's also this inflection point here, for example, that you can see. So, you can see that you can do many different things with these functions, okay? And uh, you can try, uh, depending on what you want to model, uh, different functions, and, and, and you can really do whatever you want here, because the, the possibilities are infinite, okay? Now let's look at uh, power functions where the exponent is negative, okay? Where we are looking at a negative real number. So, first of all, we have to note that uh, in these kinds of functions, x cannot be uh, zero, x cannot be equal to zero, right? If x is equal to zero, then this over here is an indetermination, okay? We have an indetermination because nothing can be divided by zero, okay, in, in, in at this level, okay? We cannot divide things by zero, okay? In this case, you can express this also as just alpha over x to the power of n, okay? This is formally what uh, raising something to the power of minus n means, okay? That is just what it's multiplied by over this to the power of n, okay? This is gen the general expression for these uh, kinds of functions, and we can certainly model uh, things that are interesting in classical political economy with these kinds of functions, and, and uh, of course this is not a pure negative power function, okay? Because you have uh, more terms than just this in particular, but this expression here is the standard wage profit curve that is implied by the Marxian pure circulating capital model. Okay, and the uh, and we saw earlier. Okay, in the last video we saw the standard Schraffian uh, wage to profit curve, and we saw that it was a linear function. Okay, in in the Schraffian system, it's a linear function. Now it is a non-linear function, okay, and it's a non-linear function that has a shape similar uh, in, in, in terms of uh, its graphical representation, similar to the shape of the functions that are of this form and uh, of an odd exponent, of a negative of odd exponent. In this case we have this odd exponent that is 1, minus 1, okay. So let's look uh, formally at how uh, the canonical example of a, of a rectangular hyperbola looks like, right? So the rectangular hyperbola is just uh, an exponent function with the exponent being minus 1, and this is the general, okay, form of, graphical form of this function. It is a hyperbola and it is a rectangular hyperbola. Here you can see that these two appear in these two quadrants, okay, the, these two parts of the function, and notice, okay, and this is going to be important also when we look at the calculus uh, uh, techniques, that 
here these lines okay this this these segments of the function get very close to the axis but don't touch it okay they don't touch the axis so but they clearly get increasingly close to the axis right so in this case this gets increasingly close to the y-axis and in this part here as well so we would say okay we would find here that uh, if we look at the formal uh, calculus uh, procedures that we have a horizontal asymptote here at this uh, line here at the, the line of uh, uh, all the possible values of y when x is equal to zero okay this is a horizontal asymptote of this function and we also have, a, sorry, this is a vertical asymptote, okay? And we also have a horizontal asymptote in uh, the values of for y equal to zero and x equal to all the real line. This would be the horizontal asymptote of this function. So we can see that these functions present these asymptotes that we can also study with calculus. And let's just look at the graphical representation of what I was uh, discussing earlier of the uh, of the nonlinear wage to profit curve implied by the standard Marxian pure circulating capital model uh, uh, wage to profit curve and basically we can see that the general okay graphical representation of this function is this one okay which looks similar to the rectangular hyperbola that we saw before only that now there are differences obviously there are differences because it's more complicated and the economically meaningful version of this uh, function is the one that is contained in sorry in the first quadrant okay, is the one that is contained in the first quadrant where you see that at the maximum rate of profit okay the maximum rate of profit in this case i set it equal to 0 0.9 and you can see that the line intersects here the x-axis at this point at 0 0.90 and the y-axis at this point which is just one okay now the wage rate in this case the maximum wage rate would be equal to one and the maximum uh, profit rate would be equal to 0 0.9 okay and this would be the economically meaningful part of this uh, function okay of the of the linear of the non-linear wage to profit curve which it comes to contrast with the one that Rafa uh, presents because he's which to profit curve is linear as we saw in the previous video so now i'm just going to finish with a uh, another uh, couple of examples okay of uh, of nonlinear functions that are typically used in economics we have here exponential functions okay and exponential functions are functions of this form okay where now x is an exponent of beta okay so x is now an exponent of this parameter beta of this coefficient so now you have alpha times beta over uh, raised to the power of x okay raised to the power of x now in economics generally we use the exponential functions where uh, beta is equal to Euler's number okay which has this form okay two two times uh, 2.718 and it extends okay so it's larger than this but normally okay with these kinds of exponential functions the graphical representation that we can see is this one okay and exponential functions are particular because as you increase x okay y increases at a at a faster rate okay you can see that here y is increasing slowly 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 but then once you reach a given point then y starts increasing even faster and as you increase x to infinity y the slope increases Okay, the, the slope becomes larger and larger and larger. Okay, so you can see that small increases in x produce larger increases of y at larger values of x than at smaller values of x. Right? And the opposite is true for the logarithmic functions. Okay, the logarithmic functions share uh, a similar idea, but now uh, you can see that uh, we're talking about uh, logarithms, right? Which have their own properties and have their own uh, formulae. And it is important here to note that this is the general structure of these uh, functions, okay? Where now you have the logarithm uh, of this uh, particular uh, of x, okay? But this is again the the coefficient beta is the coefficient here associated with the logarithm. And uh, generally, okay, in economics we also focus a lot on the functions where beta is equal to Euler's number, okay? 
once again we focus on this case and in this case we just get that y is a function of x as the natural logarithm of x okay and the natural logarithm of x here has the opposite property that we saw before okay where as you increase x first of all y can uh, x cannot take any negative values okay but as you increase x okay as you increase x in this function you can see that the function starts to increase slower and slower and slower right so the increments in y for a for a unit increment in x here is of any given number and here is of another number smaller than the one that it was here right so this is the opposite relationship to the one that we saw for the exponential function and these kinds of functions are really useful generally in uh, neoclassical economics because they uh, represent some of the principles of uh, of uh, consumer behavior that are uh, you know generally accepted to to be the case in neoclassical economics right like uh, you know the the diminishment of the uh, marginal utility as you increase the quantity of the good that you consume right so here x would be the quantity of the good that you are considering okay and y would be the utility okay so this would be a utility function y being the utility x being the the product and as you increase x you see that the utility increases for sure so the first derivative is positive but it increases at a slower and slower pace so there is a diminish a diminishing marginal utility right so this means that the second derivative of this function is negative so we just finish okay just to finish uh we we can also consider absolute value functions which are non-linear functions even though this segment looks like a line and this other segment looks like another line but these are non-linear functions non nonetheless because they don't satisfy the properties that we saw of functions remember the superposition and the homogeneity property that we saw these two uh, these kinds of functions do not do not in fact satisfy those properties so they cannot be considered to be a, a linear functions even though this segment look, looks like a line and this other segment looks like a line this is the canonical example of an absolute value function uh, but you can also add a constant and you can also uh, uh, multiply uh, the absolute value of x by a number different than one okay if you increase the alpha you will see that these two line segments here will get closer and closer to the y-axis okay it, it will get closer to the y-axis they will get closer uh, but in any case um, these functions they are useful but they are probably not going to be too useful for the purposes that um, that uh, I, I have in mind okay for the the types of models that I want to show you in um, the studies okay that are of interest in classical political economy nevertheless it's important to keep this in mind and also it's important to and this you could see this almost like an uh, an exercise okay like a test okay to see why these kinds of functions are non-linear okay you can try uh, at home to see why these functions do not satisfy the properties of linear functions that we discussed earlier and this could be seen also as, a, as an exercise as a way of seeing that you understand these concepts that i that i have presented so in any case uh this is it for this video okay i've discussed some of these categories of course, there are uh, more uh, nonlinear functions that we could talk about, but this is, you know, a, a good uh, introduction to these functions and, and how they look like and how they behave. Uh, in the future, we will be looking at a more complicated analysis of these functions. And um, with that being said, uh, I hope uh, that you enjoyed this content. I hope that uh, you learned something from this. And of course, if you have any questions, any suggestions, feel free to let me know in the comments. And uh, with that being said, I will see you in the next video.